the world of food and drink. It's full of private back doors, hidden menus, and secret ingredients. I am food writer on code. This week, I'm in Singapore, where my hometown is hiding some delicious gastronomic secrets. So this is like a mystery kind of ingredient, right? This is Secret Delicious. When it comes to food, Singapore is my domain. But do I really know everything there is to know about the food scene here? To begin my quest for all things secret, I decided to start with Paranakan chef Malcolm Lee of Candlenut. He is the only Michelin starred Nonya chef. He's cooking one of the few indigenous cuisines from our region. And so he opened this little tiny Nonya restaurant and then a couple years ago moved to, to Dempsey. Although Candlenut is known for authentic Nonya food, Malcolm Lee also makes a secret dish that I've been dying to try. It's strictly not sold to the public. Hey man. On. How's it going? Finally, this I is know. the day. You made me wait four damn years for this burger. <laughs> Finally. Four years. Well, at least the day is here. I remember seeing a video of him char grilling all these Wakalak glazed burgers. I have been pestering him for probably three to four years to taste that burger. Candlenut, we take our burger seriously. I think we started at least four years ago yeah, already. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually staff meal, right? Yeah, usually it's staff meal. So this is like a mystery kind of uh, ingredient, right? A lot of people are very interested in this uh, black nut, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, And the way to tell them is it's poisonous. It's poisonous in its raw form. And this, this black seed comes yeah, yeah. from a type of mangrove tree. Yeah, Malcolm uses it to make a delicious glaze for his burger patties. Kind of like a funky, early, funky, yeah, funky, earthy, funky like, fermented kind of smell. Like going who, on. who thought this would be delicious? Like I don't know. who in the world was like, I'm gonna go bury this in the ground and, and, for 40 days, yeah. then soak it for five days, and yeah, then I can yeah. eat it. This is really a signature ingredient for uh, you know the Peranakan. Yes. And I will actually rank it as the number one most difficult yeah. uh, thing to prep. Okay, so what do we do? Do we, we crack open the yeah. crack it open? Yeah, you crack open. This is the weak spot of it. It looks like a lid. Okay. <laughs> Now you know it's a lot of work. Yes, your, yeah. your, your black nut just spewed all over me. All yeah, over it's me. okay, it's normal. Yeah, it's so excited. <laughs> like, and this is just only like one nut. Oh yeah. my. There we go. So you can, you can just kind of take out the seeds <laughs> like that. So just the whole process of it, you're looking at like five to six days just to prepare the, the rempa before you can actually cook anything else. We have a very young kitchen. It's unbelievably young, you know. The average age is probably 24, oh. and they can produce the flavor that Popo agrees on. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they come with this sense of like, I want to know more about heritage food. You know, well, it's like, back to comfort food, right? Yeah, comfort food, exactly. Yeah. So then they start to learn the essence of it. And, and this, mm. is, this is one great example yeah. because um, they start to prep and they go like, wow, it's so long to prepare <laughs> this dish, right? So they learn that this kind of cuisine is about appreciating the craft. Yeah. And I think this translates back to not just Peranakan, but local food as yeah. well. People always say, oh, yeah, I'm the ambassador for, for local yeah, food. Yeah, yeah. But actually wrong. I'm just representing many, many passion yeah. ambassadors who are day after day yeah. in the hawker stores, in the kitchen. The irony of local cuisine is that there's a price cap because we price things through our biasness, not through thinking about labor and quality. Where is local food going to go then, if people are not willing to pay for um, good quality local food? If people are not willing to pay for lo good quality local food, okay. there's no way local food will survive. Really? Mm. Okay, so what else we need to do? We need to yeah, so, this. so now we have this, uh, this nut paste. Yes. Uh, what I do is just make a chili paste out of it. Okay. All right, so we have this right here. We put this... Ah, so you're putting it into the Inside, burger. Inside, yeah. Nice. So you kind of this, 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 this is the big secret. Yeah, you add one layer ah. of the... Aha! So you can mix it up. You know, it doesn't need to be too even. I also don't like to mix it up too much and yep. the meat starts yep. to get too kind of homogeneous. Yeah, so that, that's good enough already. 
Yeah, that's it. Quite simple. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. But you need the, that's not simple. Yeah, this is the difficult part, <laughs> right? Simple. This is the difficult okay. part. So let, let's, let's go cook the sucker up. All right, let's go, okay. let's go. I'm taking this. <laughs> that looks yeah. beautiful. It's good, yeah. It's not any how do because I'm very particular over stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like no frozen food. Everything must be fresh chicken, fresh fish, you know? Uh -huh. You should sell like tickets on the internet. You're like, yeah. okay. 10 staff meals Showtime available, five. 5 o'clock, <laughs> yeah. back door, show your, your passcode and like, yeah, we'll just, really just sell it out the door. Let it slowly cook, you know, mm. don't rush don't rush the process. This gives me like, such bragging rights that I can say to everyone that I got to have your burger. Oh man, I feel like this is like slow and low yeah. and teasing and like, oh. Uh, we're getting there. So I'll do one last, you know. <laughs> one last dip? One last dip. So this is, this is infused with so much flavor then. Yeah. There's, there's the guacalac inside the burger. Yeah. You're like the soaking glaze, in this, in this, yeah. man, this guacalac sauce. Yeah. This, is, this is the uh, third soak. Yeah, third one. Oh, man. Third and final one. You can please sambal. So this is very tr traditional. Traditional. Yeah. You can eat it with nasi lemak, fry with uh, prawns, nice. uh, thai. But that's what makes something really, really you know, exclusive, right? You're yeah. just like, no, you can't have it. It's yeah, only from my people. Yeah. You can have curry and rice only, not burgers. <laughs> What's this? This is my mom's curry recipe. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. Let's eat this puppy. Okay. I'm taking this one. <laughs> oh, it looks so good. You got the egg yolk here. I got you know? the egg yolk. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. Okay. It has this sort of like dark soy sauce, mm. olive paste, earthiness. If you like those earthy flavors, it's it's incredible. Moist. You get the ikan bilis. Egg. Mm -hmm. Wow, I think it's damn good. So many textures. Yeah. <laughs> you have like crunchy, soft. Mm. Um, the crunch from the ikan bilis. Wow. And, and, not, and not super spicy. Oh. It's very, very mellow. So much flavor. So oh, good. Wow. I'm upset that I can't have it more often. And it took me four years to get him to make one for me. And I had to like force him to be on TV to do it. And then now he won't ever do it again, <laughs> probably. So, you know, good luck to anyone who can get Malcolm to make one for him. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much. This is great. Oh my God, finally. Mm -hmm. Singapore, the epicenter of Southeast Asia's thriving nightlife scene. It's home to 11 of Asia's best bars. But beyond the visibly trendy hangouts, there are some really cool obscure gems. There's been a new renaissance of hidden bars. The cool hidden bar, which is sort of like the speakeasy kind of style, was becoming popular around the world. It became sort of this hipster place. The trendy people all wanted to be seen there. They wanted to be able to get in. Uh, it, it changed the scene. And since then, Singapore and around the world, hidden bars, speakeasies have become almost de rigueur in trendy cities. Although hidden bars can be found nowadays in unexpected places, I never thought to find one here. On the 13th floor of a swanky office building is the office of Diageo the world's largest spirits distributor. This is where they hide an elusive private bar. It's invite only for friends and family of staff. The Diageo private bar is a really cool concept. And it's a really nice cocktail bar. It's also in the middle of an office building. Hey man, thanks for bringing me here. Hey, cool. no problem at all, man. I haven't been here for like, I think seven, eight years. Okay. Didn't look like this before. Wow. Hi, how are you? Kevin is a friend, uh, he and I got along really well, and then we're similar generations, and we have similar tastes in whether it's, it's, it's food and music and art and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we bond over good wine, good whiskey, Thank good you. food. When did you first come here? I came here about a month ago, I think. It is a, a private bar of sorts, yeah. although it's in the middle of an office, which makes things even better. Yeah. Gentlemen, good evening. Hi, how are you? Hi. How are you doing? My name's On. Nice to meet Adam, you. Adam, nice to meet Hi, you, Kevin, On. Nice to meet Kevin, you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to meet you. We have somewhere that's uh, slightly more private than the bar out here. If you would be interested, I could take you in and show you a couple of things. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Follow me. Let's go. 
Gentlemen, welcome to the wow. Diageo private suite. Wow, this is really nice. Oh, it's amazing. It's a place you would only know if you were at a certain sort of level or you had friends at a certain level. The suite itself is, uh, the entrance is very foreboding. It's sort of very glitzy, very sort of swanky. You know you're not gonna go in there and drink like Cosmopolitan's. This is a home to some of the world's rarest and most exceptional whiskies. There was the Queen's Jubilee bottle, and it's a beautiful Baccarat sort of diamond-shaped decanter with a, a silver collar with a diamond stud actually in the collar. And then they had gotten permission to get wood from a forest owned by the queen to create a cask to age the whiskey in for a certain number of years, which was unheard of that you could cut down trees in her private forest. So I think it's time for some tasting, right? So I always think of the uh, Johnny Walker House private suite as like kind of like the private banking of whiskey, right? So would you uh, apply that same philosophy uh, to your clients? I think so. Part of how scarce the whiskies are that we're offering means that by the very nature, they do need to be exclusive. So what do we have mm. in front of us? This looks fantastic. So gentlemen, I've um, given you a selection of five of our cask of distinction samples for you to try. The, the sum total of the age of these five whiskies is 193 years that this whiskey has been sitting in cask. Now, I, I've been trained in sort of how to drink wine, but I don't really know for whiskey, like, do I swirl or do I, like, do I just sniff? Do I, what, great where, where do I start? If you want to swell the glass, by all means, you're <laughs> Go welcome for it, to. Right? <laughs> it will certainly help to open up some of the aroma. That's I mean, cool. It's quite complex because there's so many characteristics in the nose, so yeah. many characteristics, because it's so rich, right? So many characteristics in the palate. Kevin's much more passionate um, about whiskey than I am in terms of, I think he knows a lot more. He's tasted a lot more. I think he enjoys it a lot more. I mean, some people just like whiskey a lot. I think Kev's one of those guys. This mm. is a 41-year-old, okay. um, a single cask from Talisca. Mm -hmm. Now, Talisca is probably the most remote distillery in Scotland. Mm -hmm. It's located on an island called the Isle of Skye. And to get to the Isle of Skye is four hours from the nearest distillery. So one of the things that really um, comes through in the Talisker though that is kind of driven by its geography is this salty seaweed uh, mm. maritime flavor. It is one of the most well-known whiskeys out there, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and it's a personal favorite of mine. Talisker has always been one of my favorite whiskeys. Mm. This is the oldest whiskey we'll be trying at 42 years old. A brewer of this age, you could expect to pay somewhere in the range of 7,000 pounds per bottle, um, depending on whether it's an American oak cask or a, a European oak cask. You can buy a cask in which each bottle will cost you maybe 9,000 pounds, but the auction market, you can sell it tomorrow for 15,000 pounds. So why not, right? If you, so it's like, it's any investment. If you have the capital, you can make money. This is arguably one of the most famous peated distilleries and certainly the most famous closed distillery. That is Port Ellen. It was closed in 1983, has not made a drop of whiskey since. Um, and all we have is a very small number of casks that we're able to continue releasing today. This is fantastic. I'm not a big PD whiskey person, but the smoke doesn't overpower to me. And there's, a, there's an amazing sweetness to this, which is really quite amazing. How many casks are there left of this? That's the golden question of which I don't even yes. know that. Mm. So. It's really kind of cool though also that it's like a uh, secret bar within a bar <laughs> within an office space. Yeah, we aren't a bar. We don't sell any of the, the products we're tasting. Um, the room that we're in is is my office. This is where we meet with our clients and do it's business. The best office so, in, the, in the whole wide world. <laughs> absolutely. So it's, uh, you know, it, it is quite different to, to yeah. outside bars. And again, that's part of why it's as exclusive as it is. Yeah. The experience was really exceptional. And it was very special because it's very rare to be able to get that kind of one-on-one -on -one time with someone who knows so much about whiskey and to be able to taste whiskey that caliber. Gentlemen, well, cheers. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. I hope you've enjoyed the experience. Excellent, thank, thank you, you so thank much. You, thank you for bringing me. Oh, thanks, uh, I'm, well, you know, no worries. It's my pleasure completely. Thank you. <laughs> No.
Normally, I wouldn't expect to find a fine dining restaurant in an HDB development. But there's actually a world-class dining experience hiding in here. Opening a restaurant in Singapore is really tough. There's so much that makes it so hard to be profitable. And so if you actually don't have the money lying around, private dining is a perfect platform in which to showcase who you are. Chris Kong has cooked for some of the best restaurants in Singapore and the world. But recently, he started the Dearborn Supper Club, where he hosts private dinners in his own home. He's invited some online writers like myself for a private tasting. Hey, hey Ron, good to see you. Welcome back, man. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks. Come on in. Great, thanks. It's been a while. I mean, last time we came here, um, I think we were one of your first customers, or? Yeah, one of the, like, the first two that we were just like, we weren't even ready for you. We didn't even know what to expect. <laughs> we thought it was just going to be friends, and then uh, you showed up with your crew, and we were like, oh my gosh. I mean, it's, it's been great. The, the traction's been really good. Uh, we've been well received by everyone, and now we're fully booked for the whole year of 2019. Oh my god. So I'm yeah. lucky we got to sneak in and yeah. just sort of bu bug you a little bit and pester you. Yeah. <laughs> so what's been the most popular dish so far? I would have to say our sourdough. I've kind of created okay. this monster now. Can I meet the fable of Mr. Larry? This is Larry. So this is homegrown in Singapore 100% when nice. we moved in and we started here. Why do you think sourdough has become so popular? I think because it's just like the process of it. Now, like people understand, like you can make your own bread if you have the time and effort and you just want to try it. Uh, I was born in San Francisco, I grew up in Seattle. So my dad is originally from Malaysia, so I wanted to kind of reconnect with that side of the family, and I was like, I've been determined to stay out here, learn Asian cuisine, learn how to cook, and then come learn, back maybe. Learn, learn Chinese, yeah. awesome. I went to Malaysia. I bought a one-way ticket to Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Singapore feels more home, or at least this region uh, as well. You were telling me that like, you, in Malaysia, you worked for, uh, for a, hawker, a hawker, right? Yeah, it was so an open like, air seat. Was that something you, you, were you ready for that? So were you chopper number 17? Or like, what was your, your job? <laughs> uh, I was the prepper and passer of mise en place. Welcome. Thanks so much. All right, guys. Welcome to Dearborn. It's good to have you guys. Uh, so we're going to do a little private kind of tasting for you guys that I've done. Trying out some new dishes. Uh, we're going to have a little scallop uh, sashimi. Uh, it's going to be dressed with a little bit of turnips, some local turnips from Singapore. Uh, so he has a local palate. It's not unlike a lot of other young chefs. They want to work with as many local ingredients as possible, showcase the flavors of what they can find around them or nearby. The private dining in Singapore is relatively new. There are not that many really professionally trained chefs doing private dining. Chris is incredibly talented, and he obviously had the technical skill, technical training that proves his, his you know, experience level, proves where he worked. Okay, guys, um, so this is the first course. This is Hokkaido scallop sashimi. Uh, we have it with coconut. Uh, vinaigrette on the bottom, a little bit of ginger and green chili. Enjoy, guys. It's really good. There's like a sweetness to it with the coconut. Yeah. And the scallops. It's and really the scallops. And the turnips itself scallop. are quite sweet too, but they give a nice texture. Mm -hmm. a, little, a little bit of heat. Where's the heat? Yeah, green chili and ginger. Okay. Yeah, I like that touch. Yeah, so a little bit, but not too much. But to me, I would love a bit more acid. More acid somewhere. Okay, cool. We have to add some pickles to there. I mean, I love to adding pickles. Yeah. Yes, pickles are great. So here we have uh, my version of like a fried rice. So you have some crispy bits, some soft bits inside. Uh, so it's brown organic short grain rice. We've cooked it in a stock with cuttlefish, dried squid, dried prawns, dried anchovies. So like this natural salinity throughout the whole dish. I'm going in. Go for it. Oh. It really is the perfect like crispy bits that you want. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you like the like the exclusivity to it and like I do. that whole I, aspect I, of it? I think the, the the thing is like people don't know what to expect. Um, mm -hmm. and that's and that's a big thing for me. I want people to come and experience what the experience that I want to give them. Do you find that in a restaurant environment the conversations you would have with customers are incredibly different from what they would have when they're cooking at a private dining experience. I think we're at a restaurant where there's different couples and different people in the room. There's kind of like this, we need to be a little bit um, uh, polite yeah. in some sense. That's why I made it group bookings. So then it's a group. Okay. And then like if you have everybody that knows each other or like knows one person, there's that mm -hmm. common thread. And there's not that kind of bit of awkwardness. It's interesting because I think when people come here, they 
they know it's a home, so they're more open to talk to you. They're more willing to kind of share things with you and, and be more personal. Wow, that's beautiful. It took me about a year or two just to get yeah. it to where we, to where I feel it's, it's where it needs to be and it's yeah. not too sour and it has a nice crust and crumb as well. This is like the perfect balance, I think, of like the sourdough, like the chewiness, like it's, like you said, it's moist, but it's yeah. not like overwhelming. Oh, it's so good. I'm so, good. I'm so happy, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy. The level of umaminess, Chris gets perfect, right? I think that he's understanding now more about his own cuisine and he gets to play with his ideas and he gets to really refine his cooking, which is really cool and it's a rare opportunity for a chef. Thank you guys for coming and trying out, you know, and we got some new stuff and great to have the feedback and you guys are always welcome to come back. I think a lot of what these sort of secret bars or secret restaurants offer is a place to be very private, a place where you can do whatever you want and feel at, at ease without prying eyes. I think there are enough young local chefs that are pushing things, sometimes with premium ingredients, and sometimes in combinations you might not expect. And people want that. They like to say to other people that, you know, I got access. <laughs>